warm welcome to everybody who's joined us this evening on behalf of the chairman and trustees of the CSMBS, Mr. Sabia Sachi Mukherjee, the director general and the staff of the museum, on my own behalf and members of the Museum Society and the executive committee, and all our guests who have joined us from far and wide today, uh, from all corners of the world, I should say, from Europe, from the North American continent of Canada, the United States. So I'm so glad that you all are here and very, very happy to welcome Sifra Lenton, an old friend. And as she said a little earlier, Firoza, it's finally taking place. Yes, we have had a few hiccups. Uh, the book had to come out, which we had to be patient for. And I'm really, really happy, Sifra, that you have been able to join us today. <laughs> and we're really looking forward to the Jews of Bombay, Mumbai, and the North Konkan, a history of transnational trade, lost tribes, and a proud military heritage. Thank you so much, Sifra. I know you have a very tight schedule and so many commitments. But thank you for doing this for us. We're looking forward to this long-awaited lecture. A few words about Sifra. To those who don't know her, she is Mumbai-based writer and the Bombay History Fellow at Gateway House. She's on the Indian Council on Global Relations, which is a foreign policy think tank in Mumbai. She was awarded the 2018-19 Herbert Katz Fellowship for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania for her ongoing project on Karachi's Jewish community, which was part of the Katz Gate Center's broader theme that year on Jews in Muslim lands. A very interesting subject, and I'm so glad, Sifra, you are part of this important uh, think tank and you could contribute your thoughts on it. Sifra's earlier career, career was in journalism, with a focus on Bombay, Mumbai, South Asian Jewish history. But most notably, she wrote a really popular thrice weekly column for Midday, which was called Vintage Mumbai. And she sustained this from 1995 to 1997. And it was followed by a five part partition series for Reuters on the golden jubilee of Indian independence in 1997. But for me, she is a board of trustees member of the Sir Jacob Sassoon School by Kala Mumbai, an institution that is really very, very close to my heart. So thank you, Sifra. And a few words, ladies and gentlemen, about what we are going to hear today on the Jews of Mumbai and the North Konkan. Bombay City was once home to a vibrant community of Indian Jews in 1941, who comprised almost half the total number of the 22,000 Jews in undivided India. This community largely comprised of Arab-speaking Baghdadi Jews and the Marathi-speaking Bene Israelis. Both communities forged a unique identity for themselves in Mumbai's multicultural society through their economic, military, political, and social contributions to this city. Indian Jews have always been a small community, but because of immigration to Israel and to other parts of the Western world in post-independent years, they are today a minuscule presence in Western India. Mumbai city and adjoining Thana have under 2,000 Jews, while the Indian Jewish community in Israel has grown to about 80,000, many of them descendants of this once vibrant Jewish presence in Mumbai. Although still a very small section of Israeli society today, the Indian Jewish community in Israel maintain their connections with not only India, but specifically to Mumbai and the West Coast. The focus of this lecture will be on the origins of this community who sought colonial Bombay for its economic opportunities and most importantly, religious tolerance. How to situate 
and interpret the city's Jewish built heritage in the context of the communities and the city's history in the 19th and early 20th century and the importance of this Jewish legacy to Mumbai and the overseas Indian Jews. I don't wish to stand between the speaker and all of you. So Sifra, thank you very, very much for joining us. And before I hand you over, technical team today, ably led by Jason Johns, Yashraj, who you saw on the screen, Aishwarya and Rinalini. Thank you team for doing this. This week, it's been twice. We had the Narbada last Tuesday. And before I hand you over to Sifra, you'll probably hear the announcement at the end by Anita, Professor Anita Rane Kotari, who will be giving the vote of thanks. Our next lecture is the following Thursday, but we have one jointly tomorrow with the museum itself, and it's in the museum. It's a lecture by Professor Nayanjot Lahiri on ancient temples. So do join us for that. You probably received the e-invite. You may not see the sign up at the end, but uh, this is just a little reminder. And Anita, please follow it up at the end. So thank you so much, Sifra and tech team. I hand the speaker over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Firoza. And uh, you know, in fact, in a sense, our friendship goes back really long because I used to go to your mom's school, Miniland. So, I mean, I was there from kindergarten till the fourth standard. So we've at least seen each other. I've seen you for many, many years and I'm really happy to be doing this for you and the Museum Society. Also, I'd like to thank the tech team, which has, uh, it's, uh, I mean, we did a tech run at 2.30. So I got to meet all of them and uh, I hope the audience enjoys this lecture. Thank you so much. Okay, without much ado, I'll start my screen sharing. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about India's uh, three traditional Jewish communities, uh, a little about the Cochini Jews because they contextualize the Baghdadi Jews and the Ben Israel Jews who all share in common an ancient history on our subcontinent. So for this lecture, I will touch upon the early history of the three traditional uh, Jewish communities, the Ben Israel, or who, which literally translates to children of Israel, the Baghdadi Jews, and a bit about the Cochini Jews. So this will enable us to contextualize the two communities I will be talking about, largely the Ben Israel and the Baghdadi Jews, in the context of the history of India's West Coast and Bombay. I will be referring to Mumbai as Bombay, as it was the name of the city during this period. So, yeah. I will also highlight the relative uniqueness of each community's history, the differences in their early history, occupational profile, the languages they spoke, their dress, as you can see from the screen that uh, David Sassoon and his three sons are wearing, one, two sons and David Sassoon is wearing an Arabic outfit, while the Marathi speaking Ben Israelis are in local outfits. Okay, the languages they spoke, the degree of cultural integration with local norms, and also their religion. Although they all shared the same religion, and they're both Sephardic communities. Now here I want to draw a distinction that all three Indian traditional Indian communities are Sephardic communities in the sense they follow the liturgy or the tune and rituals of the Arab, the Jews of Arab Spain. So this is very different from what the East European Jews follow, which is known as the Ashkenazi liturgy. Now these uh, nuances, I hope will unfold in the course of my talk. And I will bring up some of these when talking about the trading networks of the Baghdadi Jews, or even the military history of the Ben Israel in the North Konkan and Bombay. I am hoping that there will be a lot of questions from this audience on the cultural traditions and rituals of the two community as time does not permit me to really touch upon everything. So it's a long lecture, so just hang in there. So at the very outset, I would also like to state that Jews in India, unlike Jewish communities all over the, over the world, have never faced any kind of anti-Semitism 
in their almost 2000 year settlement on the Indian subcontinent, except possibly in the Portuguese enclaves when the Inquisition was underway. So with this exception, Jewish communities in the subcontinent have in fact prospered by and large and were well integrated into both rural and urban Indian uh, society. So how did these three traditional communities of Jews come to the subcontinent so far away from their home? And what made them settle here? And when I'm talking about coming to the subcontinent, I'm talking about a good 1,600 to 2,000 years ago. So where communications were not that easy. The key, as I've learned in the course of my research, readings, and lived experience as an Indian Jew, is to view the history of all three communities from the sea. The sea as a symbol of continuity and a sea as a world without boundaries. If we begin our journey from biblical times, we can see how these three communities, Ben Israel, Baghdadi, and Kuchini, are connected. I want to emphasize here that these are all communities who originally settled on India's west coast. One of them, the Konkans Ben Israel community, is today considered by contemporary scholars as being a marooned community because they were, for most of their history in the Konkan, isolated from mainstream Judaism. So how did these communities arrive here? Since biblical times, the Indian subcontinent has been a fabled destination for the fleets of the legendary Jewish King Solomon, who ruled over the land of undivided Israel in 1000 BCE. These voyages are believed to have begun in the Gulf of Elat, and the destination was the Golden Ophir, which was believed to be somewhere on the western littoral of our subcontinent. So why did Solomon want to venture a royal fleet all the way to the West Coast when, when Jewish merchants and Indian merchants known as Banyas traded extensively at the emporiums and markets of Baweru or present day Baghdad? The answer is given in the Jewish Bible or the Old Testament, which states that in one year, King Solomon received 666 talents of gold, of which 400 talents were from Ophir, 120 talents came from the Queen of Sheba, and 126 talents from the kings and spice merchants of Arabia. In addition to the gold, the traded of fear consisted of luxury goods meant for kings and the nobility like silks, fine muslins, indigo, and a large amount of spices. The fleet carried minerals like brass, tin, and lead, wine, and horses as barter for Indian goods. Now, the question as to where exactly Ophir was located has eluded scholars, as material evidence 2,000 years ago is thin. But in all probability, the Bible points not just to the subcontinent, but more specifically to the western seaboard of South India. The clues are provided in the Jewish Bible itself, which talks about the goods that the Solomonic fleets brought back home. There are linguistic clues, such as Tamil and Sanskrit words that occur in the Old Testament, such as the Hebrew word tuki for peacock, which approximates to the Tamil tokai or bird with a splendid tail, the Hebrew kaf for ape, which derives from the Sanskrit kapi, and the Hebrew almuk or algam, which seems to be derived from the Sanskrit walguka for the sun sandalwood tree. Now, as we know, transoceanic voyages were unknown in the ancient period, in the BCE. We can only conjecture that the fleet took a coasting route all the way from the Gulf of Elat in the Red Sea, hugging the peninsula of Arabia, the Persian coast, Makran, and down south to the Malabar coast. This voyage, according to the Bible, took three years to complete. Now, there's a reason why I'm bringing this all up and it will become more evident to you all. Okay. So after the death of King Solomon in 935 BCE, the kingdom of Israel split into the Northern Kingdom of Israel with its capital at Samaria and the kingdom of Judah with its capital at Jerusalem. 
It took 150 years after King Solomon's death that the kingdom of Israel under the rule of Isaiah subjugated the kingdom of Judah and annexed the port of Elah. He reopened the direct trade route to India. Two important points I would like to put forward in the context of Indian Jewish history are the fact that Ophir, which various scholars have tried to identify but haven't determined, in all likelihood was the west coast of India, ties in with how India's two most ancient Jewish communities, the Malabar Jews of Cochin and the Ben Israel of the Konkan, came to the subcontinent via the sea. Secondly, that there was a flourishing trade in the North Indian Ocean in these ancient times and a well-established coasting route to India. More specifically, coming to the Ben Israel community, these are important pointers to their origin. However slim the material evidence of how they came here actually is. In contrast to the Malabari Jews of present day Kerala, who are as ancient as the Ben Israel, but in contrast to the Malabaris, as you can see on your screen, are the copper plates which they possess. It is a grant to one Joseph Raban given by a local ruler, which is dated by archeologists anywhere between the fourth century CE to the 10th century CE. Traditionally, traditionally or additionally rather, <coughs> the Ben Israel of the Konkan and Bombay are the least known among the three traditional Jewish communities. The reason why I keep emphasizing traditional is because we have two other communities, which, uh, which are the uh, Northeastern Jews and the Hyderabadi Jews or the Andhra Jews, as we call them. So these were the three traditional communities, which I am referring to. Strangely, the Ben Israel throughout their long settlement on the Indian subcontinent never referred to them as Jews, referred to themselves as Jews. They earlier called themselves Israel Lok, Teli Lok, and they were referred to locally as Shanivar Telis or Saturday oil pressers. Now, this last reference is a pointed one to the fact that this community of Telis or oil pressers never worked on a Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath. It was only later that they adopted the name Beni Israel or the children of Israel. And there is a good historical reason for this. Studies on the community point to the origin of the community as belonging to the northern kingdom of Israel, which in turn points to the which in turn points to the community as being one of the lost ten tribes of Israel. So on my screen, I'm just going to mark out the northern kingdom of Israel. And here below we have the kingdom of Judah. Okay, so the people of, from the kingdom or the two tribes from the kingdom of Judah call themselves Jews. You may recall I'd spoken about the division of the kingdom of Israel after the death of King Solomon. So the kingdom of Israel was destroyed in the year 771-72 BCE, which resulted in the dispersion of its 10 tribes to distant lands. These 10 tribes are known as the lost tribes of Israel, or the Bene Israel, or the children of the kingdom of Israel. Even today, there are communities with residual Judaic rituals who claim lost tribe descent and are re-entering mainstream Judaism. It was only the Judaic people of the two tribes of the kingdom of Judah who referred to themselves as Jews. Unfortunately, the circumstances in which the Ben Israel arrived on the shores of the Konkan foreshadowed their history for the next 1,000 years. Now, this is a region where they actually settled. It's a map of Kulaba district or the Konkan district where the Ben Israel, Ben Israelis or Raiga district where the Ben Israel settled. They settled on the non northern Konkan district, which is today known as Raikad. 
according to oral tradition within the community according to oral tradition within the community the ben israel was shipwrecked off the coast of naugao and near hineri canary islands at the mouth of mumbai harbor harbor so they were shipwrecked somewhere here where my arrow is pointing and nauka falls just across here and this of course as you can see is bombay island and bombay harbor according to their tradition only seven men and seven women survived and the rest were buried in two mounds in the ben israel's oldest cemetery on nauka beach the result of the shipwreck was this the community remained destitute and outside means the mainstream of transnational jewish diasporic life for almost 10 centuries till sometime in the medieval period they were discovered or a discovery happened this was unlike the cochini jewish settlement on the malabar coast who were already well known among the middle eastern jews Although the Ben Israelis lived in and were located close to the many medieval Konkan ports like Cheul, Alibagh, Panvel, and Rajapuri, this community of Jews were without their Torah scrolls and only remembered the foundational prayer of all Jews, that is the Shema Israel, for about the first thousand years of their settlement here. Their observance of the Jewish Sabbath, the festivals like Pesach or the Jewish Passover, which is ongoing at the moment, and the high holidays were among the other observances or rituals that they followed. They were unaware of the destruction of the second Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 CE, which is indicative that they were shipwrecked some time before this year. The community's historian Chaim Samuel Kehimker. whose book on the ben israel were post, was posthumously published in 1937 and is considered almost a source book on the community by scholars points out that the religious days introduced after the destruction of the second jewish temple like the 9th of av which is a day of mourning for jews were unknown to the community another characteristic in their pristine state was that they did follow some kind of halakhic they did follow hal halakhic laws regarding uh, their diet for example they distinguished between what was pure and impure foods so they were eating kosher in that sense they were never mixing milk and meat or meat and chicken with milk so they avoided that completely most of the food like in the konkan was prepared in coconut milk it is a miracle that the ben israel even survived as a judaic community a community they were always in small numbers in every konkan village and dispersed amongst the over 200 villages of the konkan living among local hindus and muslims it is from the early medieval period when the konkan ports became prominent that travelers to the subcontinent began writing about a community of jews no different looking than their neighbors The earliest record we have is a letter written by the famous physician and rabbi Moses Maimonides around the year 1199 or 1200 CE to the rabbis in Lunel, southern France, explaining that the distribution of his code has revived religious life as far as India. And I quote, the Jews of India know nothing about the Torah and of the laws none save the sabbath and circumcision this being an obvious reference to the ben israel and not to the cochin jews interestingly maimonides lost his brother david soon after in a shipwreck off the konkan coast and according to ben israel oral tradition it was this david an egyptian jew who survived lived amongst them and recognized the israel look as a community of jews who had to be retutored into their religion their this milestone in the early medieval period is known as the first religious revival the academic discourse today is more along the lines of another shipwreck survivor named david who is a cochini jew 
who lived amongst the community at a later period, almost maybe the 16th, almost in the 17th or 18th century before the arrival of this community to Bombay. The Benisrael before their migration to East India Company Bombay were largely tailies, farmers, shopkeepers, and interestingly, have a proud military and naval tradition. There are records of Ben Israelis being commanders in the fleets of the Marathas and the Siddhis, the Assyrian Muslim rulers of Janjira in the pre-colonial and even the colonial period. The earliest is a Sanad we have granting privileges to one Aaron Charikar by Kanoji Angre, the Maratha admiral who harassed the shipping in Bombay port. Charikar was a Nayak or commander in the Maratha Navy. I want to highlight here that the Ben Israelis are a socially very well integrated Marathi speaking community whose surnames indicate which village they originally hail from. So like most communities from the Konkan, we add a Kur to our village name. This is how the geographical spread of the community in the Konkan has been studied by researchers. And interestingly, even till today, new curves are still being added to the list. There are a few surnames like my paternal one, Pingle, which is without a curve. Now, the Maratha Peshwas too were Pingles, which tells us that the community adopted regional norms like the local Hindus and Muslims from the Konkan, who also took village surnames. So with the coming of the English company to Bombay Islet, the Ben Israelis joined the Bombay Marine and the native regiments of the Bombay Army of the company once local recruitments began from the North Konkan. Now, this local recruitment broadly coincides with the decline in Siddhi and Maratha power here. This is not to say that they were not involved in other occupations. The census reports point to them being largely involved in semi-skilled work in the 18th and 19th century, Bombay, like carpentry and masonry. According to the Gazette of Bombay City and Ireland, 1909, the first Ben Israel settled in 1730 during the English company rule of the Seven Islands. In all probability, too, members of the community may have visited the islands even under Portuguese rule, given the fact that they lived on the mainland just across the harbor. The community's second religious revival coincides with their migration to Bombay, which, and this revival was actually facilitated by the Cochini Jews, both the Pardesis and the Malabaris, and the Anglican missionaries. This happened simultaneously in the Konkan and Bombay. Their interaction with the Baghdadi Jewish merchants in the port cities of Surat and Bombay further integrated the Ben Israel into mainstream Judaism. Now, before I start talking about the Baghdadi merchant community, and there have been a lot of lectures by Joseph, Joseph Sassoon on them, uh, and I'm going to touch upon them because I want to talk about the interaction between the two communities, and I would like more questions because it's, I've just touched upon it. So if people can ask on this, it would be really good. So I just want to talk about the Ben Israelis military traditions before I move on to the Baghdadi Jews. Now, as I mentioned, the Ben Israelis all, already had a proud military tradition, even before they crossed over from the Konkan mainland to work in the native regiments of the Bombay Army and its ancillary services. In fact, the early history in Bombay is dominated by this narrative. Uh, in the 19th century, they were concentrated in Mandwi and Umarkhadi precinct in, the native, in what was known as a native city, but this was close to the headquarters of the native infantry lines once located on Paltan Road, which is just behind our Crawford Market. So here are, you have a photograph of the first Ben Israeli synagogue and the first synagogue in Bombay known as the Shar Har Rahamin, or the Gate of Mercy Synagogue on Samuel Street in the Manvi precinct where the Ben Israelis lived. It is central to understanding Ben Israel history in our city. 
It is a history that is closely linked to the identity of the community. In addition to the synagogue being the oldest and first synagogue in the city, it holds the distinction of being the community's first religious institution. And so it became the focal point of community life, much like other Jewish synagogues across the world, which also perform a religious and a community function. Now, the history of the synagogue is important because it is linked to the military tradition of the community. So al although the story of Samuel Ezekiel Devekar keeps varying in their details, in a sense, it, the synagogue was built as a thanksgiving by him because he was captured by the, uh, during the Second Mysore War. Now, Samuel Isikal Devekar is a native commandant of the Maratha Light Infantry, which was then headquartered in Bombay. Commandant, De commandant Devekar had a miraculous escape from certain death during the Second War, Second Mysore War of 1780 to 1784. He was captured with other soldiers from his regiment and brought before the ruler of Mysore, Tipu Sultan. When asked what who he was, the, uh, Samuel replied he was a Bene Israel. And on hearing this, Tipu's mother, on the advice of her Molvi, pleaded for his life as a Bene Israel or children of the old biblical kingdom of Israel are mentioned favorably in the Holy Quran. Now, although his life was spared, Commandant Dwekar remained in captivity for almost two years till he was released due to the intervention of Cochini Jewish merchants who heard about his presence amongst the army of Tipu. Now, this synagogue, as also all Ben Israel synagogues of, that followed, are built on the prototype of the Pardesi synagogue in Cochin. Now, the reason being was that Commandant Devekar went to Cochin with the Cochini merchants where he saw the synagogue of the Pardesi Jews of Jewtown in, in Mutton Cherry. Samuel Devekar, in fact, is buried in the Mutton Cherry Cemetery, which is close to the Pardesi synagogue. Now, the importance of the synagogue lies in the fact that after centuries of living scattered along the, across the villages of the Konkan, the move to Bombay in the mid 18th century followed by the building of their first synagogue in 1796, led to a more organized religious and community life. This community structure of building a synagogue with a community hall and a little compound is something that was replicated in all the Konkan villages and even in Bombay, wherever the community moved. In the early years, the Ben Israel joined the English East India Company army in large numbers. Many of them achieved the highest ranks that a native could achieve in the armed services of that time, that of a native commander. Now, I just want to touch upon is there are reams of names of Ben Israelis in the native regiments of the company's army. But I just want to talk about a few of the Ben Israelis who reached really important posts in the post-independence era. Now, some well-known Ben Israelis in independent India's armed services was Admiral B.A. Samson, who was known as Chippy Samson, who was the commanding officer of the INS Delhi in the 1950s, the flag officer commanding the Indian fleet in the 1965 war, and the first commandant of the National Defense Academy, and later chairman and managing director of Musgau Docks. And there was Major General G.R. Samson of the Indian Engineer Corps of the Army, and this was headquartered in Pune at that time. Here, I would like to make a special mention of General G.R. Jacob, who belonged to the Baghdadi Jewish community and was a rare exception to the largely to the largely Baghdadi mercantile history on the subcontinent. Now, Major General Jacob was Chief of Staff of India's Eastern Command, Army Command, and an architect of India's victory in liberating Bangladesh in the 1971 India-Pakistan War. 
So now I'm going to talk a little about the Baghdadi merchants and not too much detail because I want to combine the history and basically talk of the intersection in the history of the two communities, the Ben Israel and the Baghdadi in Bombay. Now, the second and a very well-known Jewish community is in Mumbai is actually the Baghdadi Jews who were settled first in the port city of Surat, then Bombay and Calcutta. I would like to clarify here that when the term Baghdadi Jew is used, it is used broadly as including all Middle Eastern Jewry, like the Jews of Aleppo, Basra, Aden, the areas in and around Baghdad, sometimes even the Iranian Jews and the Central Asian Jews, and even communities as far flung as Egypt and Tunisia. In all the years that I have studied the Baghdadi Jews of Bombay, I realized that there are two factors that actually bind them. First was ever since the destruction of the first Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 586 BCE, Baghdad became the undisputed religious and cultural nerve center for Judaism. It was to the ancient religious academies of Baghdad that the Sephardic Jewish communities, like even the Cochin Jews from the Malabar coast, turned to when in doubt about any religious, civil or legal issues that may arise within their communities. This is a common thread that bound the numerous Jewish trading communities that dotted the entire sweep from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean. Now, this map is actually uh, basically shows the Dow trading routes of the medieval period. And you can see here that, uh, that basically the arrows start from the Red Sea and it, of course, goes into the Gulf. It touches ports all across the West Coast, then goes into the East, into the Bay of Bengal, and to the Far East, and as far as China and even Japan. So this community of Jews was really, really active in the Indian Ocean, over very much a part of the Indian Ocean trading world. So it was trade and trading opportunities that brought the Baghdadi Jewish merchants to Indian shores. Their strong transnational community and business networks with other Baghdadi merchants based at port, port cities like Basra, Jeddah, Mokka, Aden, and further north to Cairo and Alexandria was a mainstay of their success. The first substantial documentary proof that we have about this Indian Ocean trading world and the Baghdadi Jews participation in this is actually being thrown up by the many medieval letters and even early colonial letters that have been uncovered in the Cairo Geniza documents. Now, there's one particular trail of letters or substantial body of letters that I would like to refer to. And those are the letters of one Abraham Ben Yuji as transliterated in S.D. Goyton and Mordecai Akiva Friedman's wonderful book, The India Traders of the Middle Ages, Documents from the Cairo Geniza. Now, they have transliterated this because both most of these letters are written, or most, almost all the letters are written in Judeo-Arabic script. So now, what is interesting from our point of view is not the variety and the volume of trade, carried on by these merchants in the then largely Islamic trading world, but the family connections as seen in personal requests for writing paper, the community's legal setup to deal with erring merchants, and the compulsions of leading a Jewish life, which in Ben Yuji's case eventually led to his leaving Mangalore after living there for 14 years, only in order to find a groom for his daughter. So, this is very much the kind of trading world that really continues into the colonial period. The colonial period is basically marked by finding, the Europeans finding a direct trade route to India, but it did not really disturb trade linkages that already existed then. Now, Unlike Benuji, most of the Jewish merchants were resident for short periods at port cities 
on the Western littoral of the Indian subcontinent. And the most important thing to note as far as the Baghdadi Jews are concerned is that there was no permanent settlement here, except first in the Mughal port city of Surat in the late 17th and, 8th and 18th centuries, and then later to colonial Bombay and Calcutta in the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries. So when I refer to settlement, I'm talking about merchants with their families and servants making a trading outpost their home. The first Baghdadi merchant settler in Bombay was about the time the Ben Israelis came to Bombay. And this was one Joseph Semma, a prominent merchant from Surat. Other sources tell us that the first Arabian merchant to be considered as a settler in Bombay is Solomon Jacob Solomon. Another early immigrant was the merchant Yaqob Sema Nisim. Now these early merchants were just a trickle into Bombay. So what really opened the floodgates to Baghdadi immigrant immigration into our city? One was the growing importance and prosperity of Bombay after the decimation of Maratha power in 1880. So besides this is, there were a number of factors that really come together. One was Bombay was becoming more secure, but also the fact remained that these Baghdadi merchants were in touch with East India Company residents in other port cities like Basra, Bandar Abbas, and even at Surat and Bombay. So they knew what the situation was in the city when they immigrated here. The second factor was the persecution of Jews in Baghdad, which attracted them to the island because it was complete religious freedom guaranteed by the company. The third and most important factor is the coming of David Sassoon with his wife and four children in the year 1832. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Baghdadi Jews are a trading diaspora community. So community organization plays a very important part amongst this community in regulating their religious community and business life of its merchants and their families. Now, David Sassoon was the son of Sheikh Sassoon and the Sassoon family were the traditional Nasi or community heads of the Middle Eastern Jews, wherever they came from. So it was because of the position of the Sassoon family that they became a target of the terror unleashed by Daud Pasha, a Turkish governor in Baghdad. And we know the story that David Sassoon was imprisoned and then released after the payment of a ransom. And he fled Baghdad almost as soon as he was received and went to Bushaya and then Basra and later settled in Bombay. Now this, as most historians have pointed out, is a turning point in the life of the community already resident in the city, because it meant that the spiritual and community head shifted their headquarters to the city. Now, this is very much like when the Aga Khan came and shifted to Bombay. So the spiritual head of the Koja community actually came to Bombay in the 1850s. And of course, David Sassoon as a community head of a vast trading diaspora shifted to the city. So in light of this, the community institutions built by the Sassoon family acquire even greater meaning. One, as head of his community, David Sassoon established the institutions necessary to lead a Jewish life. He built synagogues, he built the first synagogue, Baghdadi synagogue in Bombay, the Magin David. He built hospitals and schools. The first Baghdadi school being the school built in the compound of the Magin David synagogue. This structure was later pulled down and the Sir Jacob Sassoon school stands in its place. Now, Firoza said that she's very close to the Jacob Sassoon school and I'm also a trustee there. So it's close to my heart. 
Now, as regards the hospital, the first one endowed by the Sassoon family was by David Sassoon himself, and it is the Sassoon Hospital in Pune. Now, why did David Sassoon build this infrastructure? It became actually a necessity because David Sassoon and Sons was attracting their fellow Baghdadi Jews to take up employment in their businesses in India and overseas, but Bombay remained their headquarters. So most Baghdadi families in the 19th and early 20th century were resident here. Uh, Sassoon set up home and business first at 9 Tamarind Lane within the precinct of the fort in 1832 and began trading with an area he was familiar with, the Middle East. He then later forayed in a small way into the China trade in cotton, cotton piece goods, tea, indigo and opium. Now, there were two major geopolitical events that triggered the making of spectacular fortunes not just for Bombay merchants, but also the Sassoon family. And David Sassoon and Sons were well placed to take advantage of this. Sassoon was able to take advantage of this opportunity because he had strategically located his agents, inevitably his capable sons and fellow Baghdadi Jews in key locations. One was a very lucrative trade in metals, muslin, cotton, and opium from Bombay and Calcutta with China. The two ensuing open, opium wars with China from 1839 to 1842, and the second opium war from 1856 to 1860, secured the opium trade for the English company and the merchant princes from Bombay, of which David Sassoon was one. In fact, he had the foresight to station his second son, Elias, in Shanghai for 12 years from 1844 to personally supervise the business on the China end. The Sassoons went on after the first war to become the largest China traders from India. Second, or probably even the world, I wouldn't say India, in fact, the largest China traders in the world. Second, he did the same as regards England. He stationed his third son, Sassoon David, in England just three years before the American Civil War broke out from 1861 to 1865. And the demand for Indian cotton to supply the Lancashire mills led to a wild economic boom in Bombay. It was during this period of unimaginable economic prosperity in our city that a tremendous public feeling of giving back to the city took place. But David Sassoon, like his contemporary Sir Jamshi Jijiji boy, the Parsi Setia, had already begun his civic philanthropy. This was in keeping with what is termed today as imperial norms of public good, good governance, humanitarianism, and loyalty to the empire. His first contribution to the city was a large sum in 1847 towards building the David Sassoon Library or what was known as the David Sassoon Mechanics Institute, the David Sassoon Reformatory and Industrial Institution for Juvenile Offenders now located at Matunga, the Clock Tower at, uh, at uh, Veer Jiji Mata Udyan, formerly Victoria Gardens, and the statue of the Prince Consort with a Hebrew translation at its base at the Bao Dajilad Museum. Now this statue here that you see here is a bust of David Sassoon, which was given by the city of Bombay to the museum after his death. So it was really subscribed to by the residents of the city. Now, in one sense, these donations were an extension of the donations that David Sassoon and his family later contributed to building Jewish institutions across the world from the Middle East, China, Australia, and of course, India. The demise of Sassoon in 1864 did not end the Sassoon saga, their leadership of the Baghdadi Jews that, and their contribution to the city. Having fathered eight capable sons who he had trained in every aspect of business and rotated across every Sassoon office across the world, the Sassoon empire reached its zenith, but not before a split between his two oldest sons, Abdullah or Albert, 
and Elias, who was the founder of a new company called E.D. Sassoon and Company, which was primarily involved in the textile mill industry in Bombay, banking and property. Now, E.D. Sassoon, under the leadership of Jacob, the son of Elias and the grandson of David Sassoon, went on to become the biggest mill owner in Bombay, employing 15,000 mill workers in the mills in, owned by them. And the mills were between anywhere between 11 to 15 to 16 mills. The largest mill being the Jacob Sassoon Mill, built in 1893, which was the biggest spinning and weaving mill in India. Today, this mill is the NTC mill owned mill called the India United Mills Number no. One. From all that I have said, the Sassoons were central, not just to Baghdadi Jewish community life in Bombay, which became the most important city east of Swiss, but they replicated the Bombay model in a manner of speaking wherever they had a key base, whether in Hong Kong or Shanghai. So by the early 1940s, with the nationalist movement really gaining traction, the E.D. Sassoon branch of the family, which had stayed headquartered in Bombay, shifted to Shanghai. David Sassoon and company had already shifted headquarters to London long before at the turn of the 20th century. Now, as most of you are aware that today, we have a very residual Jewish presence in Bombay. Now, these are some of the civic contributions of the Sassoon family. We have the uh, David Sassoon Library, the Kala Ghoda, the Elphinstone Institution, known as the Sassoon Building, next to St. Xavier's College, the Royal Institute of Science Building, and the Gateway of India. And here are some of the uh, some of the stamps, so paper stamps that were put on bales of cloth. Uh, by the Sassoon Mills. And of course, here we have the Sassoon Docks, which was uh, built by Sir Albert Sassoon and then later sold three years later to the Bombay government. Now, as most of you are aware that today we have a very, very residual Jewish presence in Bombay and India. So according to our last India census of 2011, we are just 4,429 Jews, all India. And this is from a peak figure of 22,480 Jews in the census of 1941, which is just before, the Indian, before Indian independence and India's partition. Now, I believe personally seeing the numbers in the synagogue and all that we are actually far less than this 4,429 because by and large, most of the Jews are settled in Bombay and Thani. And then we have smaller centers in uh, Ahmedabad, in Delhi, few Jews in Calcutta, and some in Cochin. Now, the immigration, why did India's Jews immigrate? What triggered them to do so? Now, the immigration of India's and Bombay's Jewish community began soon after India's independence reaching a peak sometime between the 18, 1960s and the 1990s. The reason why they left is a mix of different factors. One, the state of Israel was founded in 1948. And prior to this, there was a strong Zionist movement in the city, encouraging community members, particularly the youngsters, to immigrate to the Jewish homeland in order to rebuild it. This has a tremendous emotional appeal to Jews the world over, as it is a realization of a Jewish homeland after 2,000 years of dispersion. Second, the closing down of Sassoon operations in India, where most Jews, Baghdadis and Ben Israelis were employed, led to their immigration not just to Israel, but other Commonwealth countries like Australia and Canada. A large chunk of Baghdadis from Bombay also have settled in London. Moreover, the immigration was also triggered by the fact that there was a bit of uncertainty about the future of India after independence. And this was also a factor that played into the closure of the Sassoon enterprises in Bombay. A feeling that must have been prevalent amongst a large section of the community 
particularly the more anglicized Baghdadi Jews. For the Ben Israel, the story was a little different. They began immigrating in large numbers in the 1950s and 1960s. And it was more an appeal for finding Jewish spouses for their children, because one member of the family went to settle in Israel, then an entire family would immigrate, leading the, the, the enticement or the need to lead a Jewish way of life in Israel, and also, of course, emerging economic opportunities in Israel, which played a, played a critical role. Today, the community of Indian Jews in Israel, which number over 80,000, are once again rediscovering and reiterating their Indian cultural roots. The Israeli community of Indian Jews are today raising funds to build an Indian Jewish Heritage Center, along with the Cochin Jewish Heritage Center, which is based in Moshav Nevatim. This is a joint effort by all Indian Jewish communities in Israel today. Moreover, with Israel, with the India-Israel bilateral relation being so good as it is today, the benefits of most Israeli Indian Jews of being a person of Indian origin has been facilitating actually a lot more frequent visits by this community back to their fatherland, which uh, uh, to their uh, to their motherland, which they refer to as India, and of course their fatherland, which they refer to as Israel. Thank you so much.